three of uh, tea time. Today's topic is a uh, spider. And uh, right here I've got the tea time repository open in a little file browser, and here I have the uh, git bash version. And uh, so today's lesson is in topics. We're still in week one. And then there's this uh, Python resources. And uh, this is just, I'm not going to teach everything today. It's just a little 45 minute intro. Last year we had a couple weeks worth of Python material. So here's uh, all that stuff. And we also had uh, YouTube videos for these. And here's a link to those. Uh, here's a neat uh, little Python cheat sheet, which has uh, basically just a quick reference for anything you need in Python as far as syntax and objects and packages are concerned. And then in case this you want, there's a few books uh, that are recommendable here for getting started in Python. And in case this list of resources isn't enough, here's a big long list of online resources. It goes for people that's new to programming, experienced programming, whichever. So today's lesson, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be presenting in an IDE known as Spider. So I'll go ahead and launch that from a terminal because it's installed on this uh, machine. It comes with the Anaconda distribution, which is a whole set of Python packages. So it's fairly similar to our studio. In the left side here, you got uh, your script. The terminal is on this bottom right here. There's a IPython console. There's also a Python console, but uh, it's not really a whole lot of uses for using the Python console if you have an IPython console. IPython is just interactive Python, so it's uh, a lot more, you could say, flexible. It allows for easier inline visualization, uh, as well as a number of other things that we'll get to later. Up in the top right, we got a file explorer, just like in RStudio. And uh, the variables will start showing up here. If you're new to Spider, this tutorial is pretty good. Uh, so I would recommend that. So just an introduction to Python as a language. It's pretty similar to R. Both are open source, which means you don't have to pay for the license. Uh, they're interpreted, which means you don't have to uh, compile them before you run them. They use uh, dynamic typing, which means you could assign anything to any variable you want, pretty much, and it, the language will figure out what you're trying to do. Might not guess right if you're not very clear on what you want, so you need to be careful of that. And the the reason we're using these for data science is both of them have a large number of packages and libraries developed for all sorts of data science purposes as well as just about everything else. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, if you're going to download Python, I'd recommend the Anaconda distribution, which is all the widely used Python tools and packages, and here's just a list of some of them. There's a couple package managers, including Conda and Pip. If you, uh, for some reason, don't have all the packages you need, you could just quickly install them using these. And then of those packages, there's IPython. Jupyter, which is a rich document. I believe we'll have a tea time going over some of the, how to use it and some of the details of that later. Matplotlib is for plotting. NumPy is all your math functions and uh, n-dimensional arrays in Python. There's pandas, which is uh, pretty much all your typical R data frame type things are found in that package. And it's important to note that there's two different versions of Python that are widely used. There's 2.7 and 3.6. They're not that different, but uh, we're going to be, in this workshop, we're going to be using uh, 2.7 because uh, that's a lot of what we use in our group, mostly because 
there's a lot more packages developed for it because not everyone has moved on to Python 3 yet. Uh, Anaconda lets you set up an environment of either one regardless of which one you have installed, so that's kind of nice. So you don't need to worry too much about which one you're installing when you uh, download Anaconda. This is just the link to download Anaconda for whichever uh, machine you're putting it on. Scikit-Image is for image processing. Scikit-Learn is for machine learning. And then uh, SciPy is all sorts of scientific applications with Python and Spider is this ID that we're using right here. And this is just a small like list of the packages. There's well over 100 in the Anaconda distribution. And as I mentioned before, this is called Spider. It's similar to our studio, which we saw yesterday. And uh, the IPython console, some of the things are, it's uh, useful and it is syntax highlighting. Uh, inline figures, so you, your plots just come up right below wherever the lines of code you use to execute them are. Uh, there's also tab completion, so if you got a really long variable name or you know you sort of know a function's name but you don't know the exact characters or something like that, you could just press tab and it'll either auto complete or if there's more than one option it'll show you those options. Uh, shell access, so if you wanted to uh, pass a command to a Linux shell or Windows, I guess, you could do that just by putting an exclamation point in front of the, or a bang symbol it's also called, in front of whatever the command is. I don't really know Windows commands, so I'm not going to show an example of that. And uh, it's really easy to access documentation for any function or packages with uh, IPython, whereas it could be a little trickier with just a straight Python console. Can you increase the font size a little bit? Oh yeah, sure, no problem. Oh, yes, I need. Is that good? So at the beginning of every script or function or whatever your document is, it's a good idea to um, import all the packages you need and initialize the environment. Uh, these three commands here are importing different packages. Matplotlib is for plotting. Uh, NumPy is all the basic math functions and n-dimensional arrays. And this as uh, extension gives it an alias. So every time I call numpy function, I don't need to type out numpy. I could just type out those two letters. And then pyplot is a module within matplotlib, and we could also just uh, alias it in the same way. This is not, this is, uh, if you try to execute this as a script, it will fail, mostly because of this command, which is an IPython command that's meant to be used in the console and uh, it will just make your figures show up in line like uh, I mentioned before. So, if I could manage to make this mouse work right, I'm just going to highlight all this and then run it all at once. So that's the environment. So some basics for uh, Python, like I mentioned before, there's a uh, it's easy to look up syntax for a function. So this type function, here's the input, you just put in any object at all and it'll return the object's type. So Python has a lot of basic objects. Uh, here's some numeric ones. So there's ints and floats. Your int is just your basic uh, integer. The float you could either designate by putting a decimal point after an integer or uh, these are also all floats. This is scientific notation. And this is just the pi constant from the numpy package. That's where it's stored. And it, one thing that might give you problems, and you might not realize this unless you know it already, is that in Python 2, if you do a division between two ints, it will do integer division. So if you do 
3 divided by 5, it will give you 0. And the way, if you don't want to do integer division, the way to fix that is just by making one of them a float. So just put a dot at the end of one of them and that'll solve that issue. It's also a Boolean here. Uh, this is for anyone who's familiar with programming, that's not equals uh, less than, greater than. The one thing that's kind of unique in Python is you actually type out and and or in your statements, whereas in other languages they'll have one or two ampersands for an and or, or uh, vertical bar or two vertical bars for an or. So let's go ahead and uh, run this and we'll see a whole bunch of these variables pop up in our variable explorer and it will also keep track of the type here. And these logical statements will evaluate pretty much as you think they will. You don't really need the parentheses here, it would still be the same thing, but uh, to make it more readable, I would, and for sanity, I would highly recommend anytime you've got a long complicated statement just to throw the parentheses in there so you know for sure what's going on. And then the, the string type in Python, there's no really character type, like any single character is just a string that happens to be really short. And the strings for any sort of text. And then we've got all sorts of iterable types. You've got uh, lists and tuples. Uh, lists are used uh, a little more often. Tuples are pretty much lists that you can't change the size of. It's fixed. Uh, lists are actually, uh, if you know computer science or have a background in that, they're uh, dynamic arrays. So the limit to those is adding elements is uh, a little bit slow compared to some other object types. And then Something fairly unique to Python is this n-dimensional array that you could create by passing it either a list or a tuple or just uh, using one of the built-in NumPy, NumPy functions will create an n-dimensional array. So if you use the uh, brackets, you get a list. If you use, alternatively, there's a range function which will uh, just give you a sequence these are identical here. The sequence using the range function will start at the first number you give it. It will end at the last, but not include it. So it will also be um, one to five, as we can see in our uh, variable explorer here. And at tuple, we're just passing the, the A, B, and C here are the arguments from back up here. So you can see what they come out to be in the variable explorer. And the array, uh, there's the a range is just like the range function except it creates an array. That's fairly straightforward. It works the same way. Uh, the, both of these functions, the range and a range, they take uh, between one and three arguments. If you just give it one, it'll start at zero and go to whatever your first argument is. So if we move over to the console here and just say range five it'll start at zero and stop before five. And this is useful because in Python indexes start at uh, zero rather than one, which is a difference from R we saw, saw yesterday. And if we have time later, we'll come back and discuss uh, the other dimensions of arrays, which is uh, part of what makes them really useful. Uh, that's this type function here. So say we wanted to uh, check the type of s, which we created as a string. You would just do type and then pass it whatever object and it will tell you there it's a string. And similarly, each object has some sort of attribute. Basically, whatever comes to the right of a little dot in a statement belongs to whatever is on the left. Whether it's a module belonging to a package or a method belonging to an object 
or a function belonging to a package or module, whatever is on the right side of the little dot become, it belongs to whatever is on the left is a nice little rule of thumb. And every object has a lot of these methods that are, or a lot of these attributes that are built in. And one way to look at them is use the dir function. And when you pass in an object, it'll tell you everything that's available for that object. So if we do that on our string, these are all the things you could do with your string. I wouldn't worry about the ones with underscores right now. Those are just uh, wrappers. I'll, 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 alternatively, if you're just in a Python console and you're not in an IDDE and you want to see your environment, you could pass it. Uh, oops. Oh, I got there. You could pass it no arguments and it will just return your environment. Everything that's currently loaded in your environment, including a bunch of hidden things that you might not actually care about. So to use one of these, uh, this is one that doesn't necessarily require an object. We just use uh, s.upper on our string. Wireless mouse is a little hard to use. Uh, I did once. I'll try again. Is that big enough now? And now we see that it's uh, that method just made it all caps now. Whereas previously we defined it as a string with these quotes it was all lowercase. And then indexing in Python, we uh, go back to our object that was x. This was just a list from uh, with numbers one through five. So I mentioned before that indexing starts at zero. So if we go to the one index, that'll actually return a two because the first index is the zero index. And the handy thing you could do in Python is you could get you could start from the back and get the last index by just passing it a negative number. And that way you don't necessarily need to know the length of something to just get the last element. And uh, it doesn't have to be the last element. You could count as from the back as far as you like. You could do negative five and that'll give you the fifth from the last. And then there's the colon here is the uh, slicing operator, which will give you um, a range between the first uh, index and the second index that you give it. If you do another slicing operator, you could also uh, give it a step size, so it'll only do like every second or third or whatever, but uh, we'll leave that for if we have time at that. And also you see here I'm starting to use the print function, which is just another way of uh, displaying it in the standard output, and it usually looks a little nicer that way. So printing from the zero index to the third index. Uh, it d once again, it doesn't include the last one. So if you do uh, zero to uh, negative one, which we said was the last index, it won't actually include the last index. If you want to get the uh, all the way to the end, you just leave it blank there. And then now we'll get into the basic statements in Python just the basics from pretty much all programming languages. Uh, in Python, they're a little bit different because you use white space here to define what is part of the if statement loop or function. And it's not, in other languages, this is just style, but in Python, it's actually the syntax. This is how you define things. You, because of this, you don't need brackets or anything. You just need a colon after you uh, define it. So here's a basic if statement. You just do the statement and then the colon. And of course, you could add an else or an uh, else if, I think, is just ELIF. So see in our environment, A is 5 and C is 3.14. So we know they're not equal, and we should know what this if statement will return. And it just, uh, the print statement, you could pass uh, 
multiple objects just by separating them with columns and we'll print them one after another. So backslash n is just, uh, that's how you make a new line in a string. And uh, one thing to note that the print statement is a statement in Python 2, but in Python 3 it is a function, which just means you put uh, parentheses here instead of the white space. And then loops, uh, this is the general format, is for blank and blank, where uh, the first thing is the index or the item, and the second thing is the iterable object. So here we're going to make our own list. It's just a, uh, this is actually a tuple of strings. And then for each letter in here, we're just going to print out the letter. Uh, similarly, we could use the uh, range function to get a list of numbers. And then here i is just the index in that list of numbers. So if we do this, we could uh, get a number for the index uh, where each of those letters are located. Uh, and just the basic loop things, this is how it works in Python. And then functions, uh, similar, just use a def to define your function. And then a return for whatever you want to return out that at the end. So here's just a function with no inputs. And we're just returning a string that uh, has the word text in it. So if we uh, run this chunk of code, we've defined our function. And now if we get a uh, call it, and it gives us the output we'd expect. And here, there's an input variable. It also worked in a little for loop to show you that you can add them in wherever you want. Uh, so, let's see, what can we pass this? Also, another thing to note is that uh, anything that you define in a function, such as the parameters or this uh, little variable here, sum x, it is not, it does not exist outside the function. Normally in Python, the scope is global, so anything I make anywhere in the script is available until you clear your uh, environment. But functions have their own little environment that end, that uh, disappears as soon as the function is finished. So sum squares is a new function in which we run an add on our x, which is just a list of numbers one through five. There's our sum. Plotting in Python, uh, the package we uh, loaded above was called matplotlib. And to do a quick demo, uh, these are just the basic plotting. Let's say we have x data and y data that we're making here. And just use the plot command and it comes up with a nice little plot here. Of course, usually you want to uh, do something a little more detailed. So the nice way to do this is have one line do each little thing. So here is a more advanced plot that has a lot of extra features. And this is, uh, the first plot is just if you're trying to explore your data, you wanna get a good look at it. But this is if you want to make something nice for a report. Let me move that up a little bit so we could uh, see the whole thing. So now we've got uh, labels on the x and y axis. We could add a log scale on the y axis. We got a grid behind it. We got all different symbols and colors to uh, show the functions we're plotting here, and we got a legend for which each one of them are. And if you uh, look in the code, there's a correspondence to pretty much every one of those things. This line here is a little unique. This uh, declares the font size in all of your plots for the entire document. 
technically I should probably put this up top with initialization because it uh, changes the entire document from here on out. And I made the font size a little bigger because it, the default is pretty small. And there's a, if you want multiple plots at a time, there's ways to do that. We're not going to go into uh, too much detail with that because uh, it's in last year's uh, presentation if you want to see that. And basically each line here defines uh, something that's going on in this plot. And the advantage to do that is if we want to get some, rid of something, or if we're not sure we want something, uh, we could just comment it out with the little hashtag or pound sign symbol there. And uh, so there I just uh, commented out the line that adds the legend. So if we run this again, now there's no legend there. So it's nice and easy to uh, mani manipulate like that. There are ways to do it in one line, but it gets really hard to read that way. And it's also hard to change, like if you wanted to change one little thing, you can't really comment it out with just one symbol like you can here. And here's a demo of just uh, using one of the packages. There's a lot of packages in Python for pretty much every computational uh, application. And signal analysis is just one of those. Signal analysis is actually located in two different packages. It's in NumPy and SciPy. And there are similar impl implementations. I think SciPy has a little more options. So here's just a demo. Uh, this function is just the, uh, we're making a wave function by adding a bunch of sine waves together. And then we'll create the data. So this is gonna be just all artificial stuff. So we'll have a thousand points. Um, we need our x data, which in this case is time. And then the amplitude is just the, what our function is returning here. And we're also going to add some noise because it doesn't really get interesting unless you do. In this case, it, we're adding uh, twice as much noise as uh, the amplitude of our assigned functions. So let's just uh, take a look at this. Uh, data here. So we got our signal, which is in blue, and then a bunch of noisy data. Well, the true signal is just the result of this function, and then all our data is in all these little red points, and you can't really even resolve that it's periodic from the points. So a nice tool to do this is the Fourier transform, which will, in evenly spaced data like this, it'll just get out uh, all the dominant frequencies. So here there's a bunch of code. Basically when you use a package, you don't need to understand how everything works. But uh, in this case, it's nice to know what a Fourier transform is. Otherwise you don't exactly understand, oh, these are all the frequencies. And uh, here I just pull out all the positive ones. And then we're going to plot uh, which ones are the most uh, relevant here and uh, we get three different frequencies which is, makes sense from our function because we got three different sine waves that we're adding and they the peaks for uh, how prevalent these are are much higher than the uh, rest of the noise or at least they are for the uh, one that I gave the most amplitude right here which is 0.8 as compared to these 0.5 and then so from this very noisy data with uh, not so wonderful signal to noise ratio, we can extract uh, these top frequencies. And here, uh, I just put a threshold at about 60,000. One of them didn't quite make it. I'm sure if we ran it again with different noise, it might be up there, it might not. 
but uh, returns the dominant frequencies here, and this is pi and uh, 4 pi there. And that corresponds to uh, this one would have a period of, well, these are the period of each of the dominant frequencies, so the inverse really. So the period here, that one's pi, that's our highest amplitude, so we definitely expect to see that rather than one of the others. It also got um, this one, whose period is 4 pi. So I'll take some questions, and we, we still have time. I'll go back and look at uh, some of the other things. So any questions? Uh, I had a question right at the beginning when you were importing. You imported the, uh, the package and then one of the modules in the package. Was the, was the second one necessary, or were you just doing that to decide it from the others? Yeah, it usually, well, it usually is necessary because the packages are so darn big that a lot of times for something like uh, SciPy, there's space functions in there, mm -hmm. and then there's specific packages in there, such as for uh, Fourier transforms, there's a whole package in there for that. Or for linear algebra, there's a whole uh, module inside the package for that. Okay, so you load the package first and then load what you need from the package? Yeah. Okay. You don't actually need to load the package first. As okay. long as you have it installed, you could just load whatever module from the package you want. Okay. And uh, a cool thing you could do is you could also load things from Python 3 into Python 2. Like if I wanted to uh, load that print function instead of the print statement, I could also do that. Okay. How can we know what kind of attributes that one variable has? Uh, the attributes? Okay. That's what the uh, dir command does. So if you do this on any variable, say uh, d was just a float, as we can see from our variable explorer, and there's, uh, well, there's not many op options really for a number, but uh, these are just the ones that are available. You could also do this on packages. So if you want to do this on our plotting package, these are a bunch of the uh, functions that we could do with our plots. So obviously you can't teach how to use every single one of these in 45 minutes. You sort of just gotta explore by yourself and uh, getting a lot of practice in helps so that you know all the basic stuff. I wouldn't go and memorize everything. It's very easy to look up. Any other questions? Oh, sure. So for Spider, there's uh, several different options. What I've been doing is uh, highlighting things and pressing Control Enter, which is the same thing you would do in uh, our studio when you just want to run one line at a time. Alternatively, uh, I believe there is a command to. Uh, run one line at a time. I think it's just, well, trial and error. Yeah, okay, it's F9, which isn't uh, the most convenient thing because it's way at the top of your keyboard. And then another thing you could do is define uh, code cells, which you could, uh, what I was highlighting and running everything at one time, that was using control enter. If you use control enter anywhere in a code cell, which is defined by the comment and then a double percent symbol, it'll run the entire code cell at a time. And you don't need to highlight it all. I didn't really want to do that for this presentation because then uh, I couldn't show things, I sh couldn't really run specific things quite as easily. Any other questions? All right, well, one How thing. How could we choose between Python 2 and Python 3, and what's all that about? Uh, well. So they're not compatible, is that correct? Well, you could run Python 2 with Anaconda, you could, or Python 3, to, regardless of which one you have installed, you could make a new environment. Uh, I'm not sh quite sure how to do that, because I haven't really needed to, but it's very easy to look up. 
Python 2, generally, you want to use it if there's a lot of older packages that you want to use in it. So basically, whether it's Python 2 or Python 3, depends on what packages you're using, because there's a lot of uh, Python 2 packages that haven't been moved over to Python 3. And sooner or later, there's going to be a lot of packages in Python 3 that, were, that have recently been developed and were never even used in Python 2. But if you're just using the basic stuff in Python, uh, and not any special packages, you should probably learn Python 3 because that way, well, if you learn Python 2, at some point down the line, you might need to learn Python 3. Is that possible to have a dots in a variable's name? I wouldn't recommend it because it's kind of um, misleading. Is it possible? Probably. Python gets you, lets you get away with a lot of things that could break your code later, and it doesn't necessarily tell you. So if we wanted to sign this as s.a, okay, it does yell at us. So this is something that it does not let you do. So no, I wouldn't include a dot in your variable name. If you want to separate it somehow, I would use a dash or an underscore. Yeah, okay. okay, capital letters, so if we want to do S array or something, yeah, this is camelback, but it does let you do understores. So one little thing in our remaining time is something that's uh, a little bit unintuitive, but uh, can break your code if you don't know about it is suppose we have two variables. Let's say we assign x to 3 and y assigned to 5. Now we assign um, y to x and you would, as you would expect when you look at y it's now equal to 3 and if you change x and assign it to 2 y does not change. However, you cannot say the same thing about arrays. So let's have x equal the array. And then let's uh, assign y equal to that x array. What it's doing is it's only assigning y to the address of that array. It's not actually copying it and making a new object for y. So now if you change x, let's change the uh, second index, which is the 1 index, which you do with the uh, brackets. Let's set it equal to negative 1 so we could see it fairly easily. And then let's look at x, as you'd expect, it's changed. But now when we look at y, it has also changed. So when you want to copy uh, a list, what you do is um, you set y equal to uh, or you assign y to x and then you do the colon as the slicing operator in the middle of the brackets and that will copy it. This does not however work for arrays. Arrays have an attribute that's, uh, well, let's create one. So let's assign x as just the array version of x. So now it's transitioning from an array to, or from a list to an array. So if we did uh, y equals the, this is what we, I just went over for uh, how to copy a list. This doesn't actually work on arrays. Or I need to put the uh, variable name in front of it. I might, it won't tell you that it doesn't work, but it's not actually copying anything. So what you have to do for arrays is there's a special attribute in there called uh, dot copy. And pretty much any well-developed object will have an attribute like this. So keep that in mind if you're copying uh, any sort of non-primitive object. Now it'll be its own version. And uh, another thing with the rays is we've just been looking at the one-dimensional ones here. You can make them in any dimension you want. 
this can be useful for images or essentially just a two-dimensional array where each uh, pixel is its own little index in, in there. So to make a two-dimensional array, what you could do is see. I'm going to make one out of the uh, see if we can find some lists that we have already. All right, so use the numpy array command, which is the same thing you would use on a list to convert it to an array. But now let's do uh, you would uh, separate a list by commas, and those would be the rows. So if we want to do this on string list, I'm not sure why you would want to use a numpy list for something that's uh, for numpy array for something that's not numeric but uh, this is just for this example oh uh, yeah you got to put brackets around the list and sort of make it like a list of lists and then it will come out correctly Uh, it's just a typo. Okay, so now if we look at X, it should be a two-dimensional array. Every single row is the same just because we passed it the same thing three times. And you could repeat this for multi-dimensional, but generally you don't want to build them by hand. So there are functions in NumPy that will let you set up an array of whatever dimensions you want. Uh, one of them is called zeros. So if we do np dot zeros, I believe there's an e in there. And then we just use the question mark to look at the guess there's not an e in there. We could look at the documentation. Alternatively, uh, the help function is also gives you a look at uh, the documentation. And the help is a little more detailed. If you just want to see the inputs and the outputs, then you could do the question mark. But the help gives you a full detail about the parameters. And here it says the uh, main parameter that we're interested in right now is just the shape. So if you input the shape of whatever n-dimensional array you want in the uh, as an output, that's what goes in this. So np dot zeros and we want to make it two by three. That's uh, a list, I guess. Yeah, if you now we have a two by three array, and we could do this for as many dimensions as we want. And there's a similar command called zeros like. So this is where tab completion starts coming in handy, is if you don't know the full name of something, if you're not sure if there's an under, underscore or whatever, you could use tab and it'll show you all the options, or if there's only one, it will auto-complete for you. And this will construct an array in the same shape as whatever one you pass it. All right, we're just about out of time. Are there any more questions? Um, that the tree widget, attributes, has attributes? Uh, can you restate the question? For objects, um, they don't. But if you're talking about, like, a package could have a module, and then a module could have a function. That, in, in that case, yes, but attributes, when you use the word attributes, you're generally just referring to what an object has. And in that case, no, not really. Well, if you're, I can't say, well, let me put it this way. If you put another attribute at the end of uh, this one, it will be acting upon whatever the output is here.
will be acting on whatever object in the order that you append them to it. So if I do s that upper and then dot lower, this should uh, make it upper case and then lower case. So yeah, it's all, now it's all lower case. So it's sort of like putting a function inside of a function. That's uh, one of the packages we loaded earlier. That's the alias we gave for the NumPy package. So anytime we want to use anything from NumPy, we just type out NP instead of the Pi character. All right, thank you very much.